Hi, I'm Lisa Turkhurst and welcome to Therapy and Theology. This is some of the most favorite time that I have recording these sessions with Therapy and Theology with two men that are very, very dear friends of mine, Joel Mutamale, and we get to work together at Proverbs 31 Ministries. Tell us a little bit about what you do there. Yeah, I get to serve as Director of Theology and Research and uh, bring oversight to our theological development, formation, uh, and I really think that I have the best job in the entire world. That's good, because if you left, I'm, I'm leaving with you, so <laughs> just going to go ahead and get that out of okay, the way. Good. Um, and then also my personal counselor, Jim Crest. Jim, tell us a little bit about you and what your passion is in counseling. Yeah, I like to tell people that uh, we have more help than they have problems, and to just get into the narrative and the story of people's lives, as you've heard said before, and now you have in a book that we simply collect dots, connect dots, and hopefully correct the dots. Mm -hmm and just walk people uh, through their pain, through some of the things like is in Hebrews 12 that are hindering them from running the race and seeing some, some people set free. I love doing it every day. That's awesome. And I'm so grateful for you. Not only does Jim help me out, but many people I love come to see Jim too. And so just so grateful. Today we're talking about a very important topic, shame and guilt. And, you know, I was thinking about this before we uh, stepped on camera today. I have carried the weight of feeling just rejected and betrayed. I've carried the weight of having breast cancer. I have carried the weight of disappointment. But I'm telling you, the hardest, most heavy weight I've ever carried is the weight of shame. Mm -hmm. And for me, mine really played out in my early 20s when um, before I was married I got pregnant and was just very uneducated about options and choices and I was just very desperate. I felt alone. I was not really walking with the Lord at that point and was too afraid to ask for wise counsel. So I went to an abortion clinic and I had an abortion and the weight of shame that came upon me was the heaviest weight I've ever known. So when we talk about this today, none of us are far removed from this uh, shame and guilt topic. It's something that we've all experienced. So I just wanted to normalize the reality that this is a common human dynamic. And I think one trick that either our minds can play on us or that the enemy can play on us is to make us feel like we're the only one. And I think that's part of the setup for shame, the isolation, the intimidation, and just feeling like no one else in the world could possibly uh, be okay with me because I'm not even okay with me. So let's start off first, let's define shame. And then let's talk about how does it play out? How do we recognize some of those thoughts or some of the reactions that we're having in life where, okay, this is shame? Because we're also talking about guilt and shame and guilt are not one and the same. Yeah, yeah. So really what good. do you think, Jim? Well, I say, and you've heard me say this, that shame, I say, stands for S-H-A-M-E, self-hatred at my expense. It's always about condemnation literally condemning myself. And there's a message, which we're going to get into another episode of Shame Scripts, but there's a message that something is, is clearly defective in me. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong as we get to guilt. It has been said, well, that guilt is, you know, I've done something wrong. There's healthy guilt, which we'll get into later. But shame is, I am someone wrong. Okay, say the acronym one more time, because I love to take notes yeah. during the podcast, and I just need a refresher really I, quick. I just say that shame, S-H-A-M-E, stands for self Hatred. I hate myself. There's the condemnation. Self-hatred at my expense because it cost me. It cost me of myself. It cost me in my relationship with others. And it will cost me certainly in my relationship with God. And Romans 8, 1 tells us there's therefore now no shame, if you will, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And experientially, if I'm in shame, walking in shame, not that I've lost my salvation, don't worry to our resident theologian, but experientially or functionally I've kind of stepped outside of Christ Jesus for a moment. It's like I'm not walking with Him because walking with Him there is no condemnation. So self-hatred, I hate myself, and it costs me a lot at my expense. It costs me a lot, quite frankly. 
So good. Yeah, so and good. I've often said, um, I think I talked about this in my book, Uninvited, which is primarily a book about rejection when you feel left out, less than, and lonely. Mm -hmm. And something that I became aware of is that a lot of times something will happen to me and or I will make a choice. And from that, I develop a line that I say inside of my head. And that line, eventually, if unattended to, mm -hmm. turns into a label that I put on myself. Right. So you were saying shame isn't just that we've done something wrong, but it's, it's us determining we are something wrong. So then the line that either someone else spoke over me or I have this perception and I've spoken it over myself, that line turns into a label, then that label, very quickly turns into a lie that I believe. And I find myself really turning more to the lie rather than turning to the truth. And I want God's words to be the words that become the story of my life, not this lie that I believe because of a line that was spoken over me that I labeled myself with. So the lie turns into a label, uh, or the, the line turns into a label, turns into a lie, and that lie then turns into a liability. Totally. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is kind of the way for me that it starts to play out. And when I say a liability, it turns into a liability not just of holding things that hold me back, but also liability in my relationships yeah. and liability even in my relationship with God. Yeah. So, okay, so we know now the difference between shame and guilt, but how does it play out for you, Joel? Like what starts to happen that you're able to identify, ooh, that's shame? Yeah, I think one of the big things that happens for me is when I begin to think about my own immediate consequences, like when I think about shame. Um, and then I, to Jim's point, I get to self-hatred, I get to self-condemnation. Um, I begin to live in my own brain and my own echo chamber uh, of all the things that I have done yeah. wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I begin to tell these stories about myself and it almost it turns into an over-exaggeration of myself, not in the way that God sees me, but I would say in the way that the enemy sees me and in the way that is uh, exalted by our fallen nature. So what's really interesting is that I think both of you have said four words, uh, and there's a fifth kind of idea. So we've talked about um, guilt, we've talked about shame, we've talked about conviction, and we've talked about condemnation. Um, and the theologically, like once we introduce the theology concept here, I would just suggest that um, guilt and conviction are actually really two godly, theologically appropriate responses. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us that you and I were created in the likeness and image of God. So I wanna to go to identity here. Um, what does it mean that we were created in the likeness and image of God? In the ancient Near East, so this is like Mesopotamia and uh, the Canaanites and on all those ancient people. And hold on, because you know, Joel is about to get in his feels <laughs> right here, y'all. He is really, I mean, this is, this is why I like to work with Joel. Because I'm like, no, I haven't actually taught, thought of Mesopotamia in a while. But, <laughs> but, but let's go there because yeah. I know it's going to lead me somewhere good. So don't tune out right here. I yeah. want you to really get this because it's going to be good. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Because we, we, we read a phrase like likeness and image and we just bypass it so yeah. quickly, right? Mm -hmm. But it's rooted in a historical context. And the context is that when those words are being used at that time around those people, um, it was actually a reflection of a king and his children. So you would depict the likeness or the image of royalty with their children and you would use those exact same words and phrases. So when Moses, who I think uh, is writing Genesis, says that Adam and Eve were created in the likeness and in the image of God, this is an identification of our sonship, of our daughtership, of the fact that we are made in the likeness and the image of the royal king of yes. heaven and earth. And so this means the way that we think of ourselves should be through the lens of this theological truth, not what the enemy wants to step in and kind of um, bypass. And so this is just another really quick thought. If we, guilt is a good thing in the sense that it lets us know that this is not how it ought to be, yeah. right? Guilt left unattended, use that word, Lisa, gift, guilt left unattended turns to shame. 
And it's the shame. It's in that sweet little spot between guilt and shame that I think the enemy loves to play. Mm. So the same thing with conviction and condemnation. Conviction is a good, good thing. It reminds us that we have an area that we have to reorient ourselves mm-hmm. to with God. However, if we don't act in response to the conviction, that little spot is where the enemy steps in and mm-hmm. that turns into condemnation. Conviction and guilt are meant to cause our hearts to turn back to Yahweh, turn back to God. But mm-hmm. guilt, uh, but shame and condemnation are tools used by the enemy to cause us to run away. Mm, That is so good, Joel. And we were talking earlier too about you saying that it, it was not just what the feeling was in the moment, but it's where it's leading us to ultimately. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is really important when we have a thought that we need to play that out a little bit and, and ask like, where is this lead? If this is leading me, because conviction, um, if, attended to when when we are it's it's almost like the the holy spirit is yeah. kind of prompting us like this is this is not what you need to be saying this is not what you need to be doing or don't participate in this activity or don't turn to this as a coping mechanism or whatever but that that conviction is leading us to repentance mm-hmm. or even to prevention of sin like it's it's saying don't do this because if you do this, it's going to cause you to get into this sin or it's going to cause you to, to feel in a way that is not in keeping with who you really are. Yeah. But that condemnation, if it, if it gets to that place where we're just feeling ultimately condemned, that's also going to lead us somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that condemnation will lead us into shame and shame Jim I I want you to comment on this shame is going to lead us into something to cover up that shame because the thing about shame is it it is of the darkness and when kept in the darkness it leads us further and further and further away from God's very best to us it's almost like shame is a driving force to get legitimate needs met in in an illegitimate way and there is a plethora, I mean, a, just a plethora of addictions and distractions and sin cycles that, that people can get into when this happens, right? It's so true. And to go back to, which we've done on these podcasts before, to go back to Genesis 3, you're in Genesis 2, they're naked and unashamed. Genesis 3, all of a sudden their eyes are open. Uh-oh. And they go from naked and unashamed to naked and ashamed. And so interesting, the way I see it is then in that narrative with Adam and Eve, they grab fig leaves to cover their inadequacies. What was so beautiful and precious before is like now so shameful and so scary. Then they jump over in bushes to hide from interesting from themselves like you can hide from yourself people try to they'll disconnect from themselves shame is always about disconnection it is always about disconnection interesting that healthy guilt will lead us to connection if we follow the path like to psalm 51 a broken and contrite heart god won't despise and so they're over there hiding from themselves like you can hide from yourself hiding from each other and then hiding from God. So what we want in life is connection. We're wired for it. And what we do in shame is we literally disconnect. Once I can disconnect, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. We were literally born, you know, in utero, we're connected with an umbilical cord to mom. So uh, nobody is going to stay disconnected. Mm -hmm. They will reach out and it really doesn't matter. They will reach out for something. Addictions are usually shame driven and yes, trauma driven, but out of trauma, those messages can be, I'm a loser, I'm unwanted, those shame messages. So I will reach out for something in shame, but usually not something good. And that guilt part is so interesting that both the Bible would teach, I believe, and if you want to call it secular psychology would teach, we need healthy guilt because if we don't, see, everybody has a personal value system. Everybody has a value system. Guilt is that, 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 that whisper in your ear, or maybe someone's yelling in your ear saying, this is incongruent with what you say you believe. And certainly in the Word of God, this is incongruent with what your values are as a Christian. So guilt is a friend saying, stop, don't go down that path. 
Shame will say, actually do go down this path. And then the last thing I want to say is if you try to fight shame with shame, it's one of the most common things people will do. They're in shame and they fight shame with shame, shame themselves more or watch somebody outside basically tries to shame them as someone's in their own shame and then you speak even words of condemnation over there. I see that all the time, which is either way you doing it or another person trying to fight shame with shame. That will spin you down that vortex of shame darkness really quickly. And I think, Jim, what you're saying and Lisa, what you've said, there's this underlying current or thread, which is um, the difference between isolation, individualization, and darkness to versus, biblically, the people of God, the family of God, the presence of the Spirit of God to unite us together to be able to deal with these issues. And so um, I do think one of the, the tragedies of um, part of our cultural context and situation is that we have felt more alone than we've ever felt before, but we have more opportunity to quote unquote connect to each other, you know? Um, and so I just think that's really interesting that one path, uh, this path of shame and condemnation will lead you to self-isolation and self-hatred. And disconnection. And disconnection, yeah. That we're wired for connection. And that, and, and that isolation piece, I think we started off, I think we started off this podcast when we talk about any level of disconnection and isolation, mm -hmm. here's the practical yet deadly part. If I can get isolated and disconnected over here, everything's possible. People say, how could you do this? Or, which is not a wise thing to say, by the way, what were you thinking? In shame, they're in that limbic brain that we've talked about here before. They're not thinking. This prefrontal cortex, pre cortex is offline. So they're there and it's like, what were you thinking? Not a really good question. They're not thinking. And once I go down, I say that shame is the runway for addiction to take off on. So when you're in shame, all things are possible. How could you do that? I'm in shame, I'm disconnected, I can do anything. And the limbic part of the brain is that fight, flight, freeze, um, freak out. Freak out. Yes. And you've even said fornicate. Yeah. I mean, you it know, really so is or forage. People, all this eating stuff is very primal, if you will, or very limbic brain, because it's about, I feel like I'm dying, and therefore I am going to do something. Fight, flight, freeze, freak out, fornicate, a lot of sexual activity is that way. And here's the thing, the worst of the three major Fs, fight, flight, or freeze, is freeze. Shame is notorious for getting someone to freeze, because at least in fight or flight, you got some movement going, but you get in that and you literally will get paralyzed in shame. It just cements it layer after layer. And you can go down a rabbit hole so deep in shame that it can feel like it's quite hard to come out of. So speaking of that, how do we come out of it? Or how do we help someone who we know is, is already down in that vortex of shame? Because this is really the root of addictions. It it's at the root of narcissism. A lot of people think that the root of narcissism is pride. It, it's really a, a cover up for some deep, deep shame that, that is there. And, and that, you know, it's not just narcissistic personality disorder, but it's narcissistic tendencies, which we all have. But at, at the root of it, it's some kind of cover up for shame. So addictions and narcissism. And, you know, we were talking earlier, even like binging on Netflix or overeating. Or Which is whatever. its own connection, right? Yeah. People say, well, you said you'll always reach out for a connection, even in shame. That's a connection that I can binge watch however much. And it'll even there, notice, we're watching those shows. I'm not against Netflix. But the body and brain and soul, I believe, there is going to feel like, yeah, I know those people in that sitcom or in that drama or in that movie. Those are all stories and narratives. We're wired for story, so it will feel like I'm connected in kind of an, an alternative world, yeah. but it's still about connection, right? And, and the same thing with pornography, right. you know? And it's kind of like, I know sometimes when people do not struggle with pornography, right. they look at pornography and they just don't get it. Mm -hmm. But if you understand it, looking through the lens of shame, it is a way to connect with no emotional responsibility. Yeah. And I love that. And we're going to do our podcast coming up on emotional maturity and immaturity. And, and when you look at that dynamically on just the pornography issue, it doesn't require the person viewing it mm 
to show up. The Trinity invented sex, not man. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit invented sexuality for bonding, attachment, oneness. And so when someone is there viewing pornography, it will feel like that there is a connection. Virtually they feel like they actually are being sexual. And then the problem is at the end of that, in sex between a man and a woman, there would be oxytocin. Everybody knows mothers with babies and bonding. The bonding chemical, guys, all those uh, neurochemicals plummet at the end of sexuality. And when they plummet, the only one God left there that we know of is oxytocin to bond. Mm -hmm. Well, when you are by yourself and watching that at the end of it, that's why despair mm -hmm. is always at the end of an acting out sexual cycle, you're left to bond with nothingness. Wow. Nothing. You can't bond with yourself. So therefore, you've reached out for connection in the end, extremely feeling like I am so utterly alone. So I want to get to what is the solution, because yeah. I would imagine that biblically and psychologically there are solutions. So I want to get to those, but as the connection, let me just read a verse, because I think that this is, this is very telling. It's uh, one that we were talking about, Jim, from Jeremiah chapter 2. I want to go uh, before verse 13, I want to go to Jeremiah 2, halfway through verse 11. And it says, but my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. So they've exchanged the connection with a God that satisfies, a God that gives peace, a God that gives um, just joy. And they've, they've traded that for worthless idols that in the end are no connection at all. And then let's keep going down to verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And I've been in Israel before and actually put my eyes on a cistern. And it is muddy. It is, it is uh, sometimes stagnant. And it is no substitute at all for a spring that you could literally hold your water bottle up to and with confidence know that this is living water. This is water that's going to be good. And if you stick your water bottle down in a broken cistern, I mean, you could very well pull up mud. Yes, there's an element of water to it, but it's not going to be satisfaction. Think know? about, which we've talked about before, is not think about it. You know this. The dilemma in having worked with many people with addictions, the thing that the broken cistern does do, it is on demand. G-O-D, I've said, G-O-D does not stand for God on demand. So he is living water, he provides the living water, it's everything, but that lack of trust, the sense that you won't be there, God, and I've watched in one point for a year after college, lived at the Salvation Army with alcoholics and drug addicts, and the stuff they would try to drink, the in unbelievable ways they try to get alcohol, but they knew it was on demand. So the broken cistern is deadly, it's terrible, but it's on demand. And some people would say, I would rather have this. And yes, it's muddy water, but I can get it whenever I want. Mm -hmm. You've seen people, we've all seen people destroy their lives with addictions because I know if I drink the bottle, if I take the drugs, if I act out with porn, it is here instantly, it is here now. In the moment, it feels like a connection watch to the broken cistern, but in the end, as the Word of God says, I've set before Deuteronomy 30, life and death, blessing and cursing, I say to chew life. It chews life, it feels like life in the moment, because it'll numb out, even a broken cistern, but it always delivers death. It's yeah. just in that moment. I've said before, so my issue isn't so much drugs and alcohol and all of that, but more like French fries. <laughs> Can I get a witness? So, you know, so I've said before, it's, it's, much easier sometimes to figure out how to drive through a fast food restaurant and get french fries that will give me a temporary sense of fullness yeah. and sometimes, usually in less than five minutes because oh, they're yeah. running the clock in the drive through you better get them through yes and so sometimes it's easier to get that instant satisfaction of french fries than it is to open up my bible and get that hit of instant satisfaction so mm -hmm. you know i just I think no matter where you're at, humanity does this. It's not just the children of Israel. It, it is a human condition. 
So we've established like what it does to us, this shame and, and condemnation, the difference between guilt, which can lead to repentance and, and conviction, which can you know, prompt us to not do something as opposed to condemnation, which keeps us away from God and stuck in possibly yes. a sin <clears throat> cycle. So we've talked about all that, but what do we do? Okay, we recognize sin in us or, or shame in us, and we recognize maybe somebody stuck in a cycle of shame that we love very much. Jim, you've mentioned a couple of things. Don't say, um, what were you thinking? I think that's a really good, helpful, practical tip. But what do we do? And I'd love to hear both from Joel and Jim on this. What do we do when Joel. shame is very present? Yeah, I, I would say let's listen to what Paul says. And um, this might be helpful. Ephesians 4. Uh, and I think it's important to understand what's happening in the city of Ephesus. Uh, the Temple of Artemis is there. It's one of the wonders of the world. This is a place when we talk about all these things, I mean, debauchery and fornication and drug addiction. I mean, this was rampant in yeah. uh, in the Temple of Artemis. Nothing new under the sun, There right? ain't nothing new <laughs> underneath the sun. Uh, we've been turning to the same vices uh, for for ages since the beginning and yet there's a virtue uh, that God has given us that we should seek after and this is how Paul describes it and what Paul is doing is really summarizing what we've been talking about this idea that and we're going to talk about it more later there is an old self that is associated with a dark way of living um, that is bent on self-glorification which is ultimately self-hatred I'm curious what you think about that but that's kind of what I think right that's where it ends yeah like we think we're glorifying ourselves but actually we're it's an active hatred yeah. of self-hatred and so it's so it's so intriguing but this is what Paul says and he starts in verse 22. Okay he, what chapter are we in? Ephesians chapter 4. Okay. I would definitely suggest you read verses 17 through 22. He talks about the futility of our minds. We were once darkened in our understanding. We were alienated from the life of God so that is our past sense but then in verse 22 he says this to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through what deceitful desires and to be renewed so we were once corrupt but to be renewed in what the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after what the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness and I think this is the very practical and unexpected how do we do this therefore having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so I do really believe what Paul is getting at here is, in a sense, what do we do? We do what we've just done. We have to identify the falsehoods. We've got to name them for what they are. We've got to see them for what they are. Um, One of the things I've learned, Jim, from you and from Lisa is actually tangibly, sometimes writing these things out so you can visibly see them. But I also see this other great principle that Paul is getting at. And the principle is we were not meant to do this alone. To be a part of the family of God is to be surrounded with brothers and sisters that can speak the truth of the gospel into your life. What is the truth of the gospel? That you are not your worst moment, right? You are not your best moment. That's good, like, yeah. Like you are a reflection of Christ on the cross and his victory over sin and death. And so just very tangibly being in relationship. And so I would just say and suggest if you find yourself isolated from the family of God, that is one indication, one tangible step to fight aggressively, to be connected to the family of God. And that typically happens within the local church. And Joel, it's not just about going to church, although that is important. But if we go and we're just sitting on the last row or, you know, in that last uh, section of seats and we're not ever connecting personally with people, then we're kind of missing Mm -hmm. what's so important here. And that is connection. And Jim, you've taught me this. It's really about intimacy and it's having someone close enough or a group of people close enough where you feel safe enough to have into me you see intimacy and you know it's not that we want to be completely naked with someone but it's that we want to have an opportunity with people to see the stripped down version of us the the part of us without the performance without the pretense without all the accolades and without all the props you know it's just the stripped down version of me emotionally 
and maybe spiritually that you allow them to see. Naked we came into this world, naked we'll go out of this world, but vulnerability, even though we wear clothes, but vulnerability is what really provides intimacy. So Joel, what you're saying is having those connections biblically is part of how we can get out of isolation, which isolation, it seems like, is kind of feeding into the shame and continuing the cycle of shame. Yeah, and I would just say very practically too, when you have that level of connectivity and intimacy, uh, we've been working together long enough where we could say, hey, I kind of, ha understand that you have this tell and you're beginning to work down this spiral and that's that that intersection that we have responsibilities brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to speak truth in love in those moments um, in a way that if I am isolated I'm not gonna be able to see those on my own I'm just gonna keep going down that that black hole and so yeah and sometimes I think shame sneaks out in snarky comments people make about themselves and others oh. No you question. Know? And so sometimes I think if you're in a safe, more intimate friendship with someone, you can have the opportunity to say, stop that thought. Yeah. yeah. Like take that thought or I'll see them um, or I can even find myself being resistant to take a compliment. Because it's almost like me saying, oh, if you really knew me, you would never say something so nice. So sometimes when I see people resisting a compliment that I give them, I'll say, no, I want you to take that compliment. Yes. I want you to put mm -hmm. it right here on your chest. I want you to rub it in and let it sink in <laughs> Love that. because it's truth. And the resistance that you're feeling right now is because the truth I'm speaking over you is bumping into a lie that you're carrying inside. Oof. And you need to make room for the truth by uninviting the lie from inside of you. Love it. Yeah. So Jim, I would love yep. just any counseling uh, wisdom or wisdom that comes from your counseling brilliance. So if I'm sitting in front of you today on your famous couch and I am struggling with shame, what are you telling me? Like what, what is, what is the thing that I need to remember or shift in my thinking? Uh, I'm going to start with what I call the hub of communication. It's the hub of connection. I hear you. And you know, people can hear this and think, well, that's just cheesy or trite. No, it's not. It's simple. The hub is I hear you. You as I understand you or I'm trying to understand you. And B as I believe you. And often I'll say people very simply, that makes sense. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. So I want to connect that way. The person understands that I'm trying to be safe. If you share, according to researcher Dr. Brene Brown, and we know this experientially, if you share your shame story, your trauma story, your abuse story with someone who's not safe, it literally will just explode inside you and make it worse. Safety is crucial. That's to a degree why a lot of counseling exists to go in. It's confidential. It's safe. Dr. Brene Brown again says the key that she's found in her research on uh, dealing with shame, like indeed an antidote to shame, is empathy. Notice empathy for yourself. I also like the word compassion. Dr. Kristen Neff's an incredible book called Self-Compassion. Calm means with, passion to suffer. So I want to, in, in an appropriate way, suffer with my story. I want to walk with my story, looking for self-empathy, and then an empathy for someone who says, tell me more. That's, I tell people constantly, if you don't do anything else in a relationship, say, is there more? Tell me more. Invite them to share. And then, as I look at uh, another Brene Brown quote that I love and I've used time and time again, it's been on this podcast before. Talking about dealing with shame, an antidote to that. She says, we tend to orphan off parts of our story. I'm not going to share that. If I could tell you how many times people have left my office and come back or in the middle of the office said, I was taking that one to my grave. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about if you're in a rut in your life, that's just a grave with both ends knocked out of it already. I'm taking that one to my grave. Don't take things to your grave. Share it with one to two people. So she says, we tend to orphan off parts of our story and you can't do that. And no, she adds, which I love is, you either walk inside your story, all of it, or you will spend your life walking outside your story and outside yourself and do what? Hustle for your worthiness. If there was ever a shame driven statement, I will be hustling for my worthiness. Maybe I can be worthy with God. Maybe if I do this, I'll get God's approval. Maybe you are, which is one of the heights of shame, is the perfectionist. 
and some Enneagram numbers, which is not for this program today, struggle with that because the perfectionism is one guarantee you can never pull off. You will constantly fall back in shame. Empathy, self-empathy, empathy of another person toward you. And then I just want to add to it, which may take some time to get to for a person, Psalm 51. In the addiction cycle is you have shame at the top of it. That's the runway for that thing to take off. You're thinking about a preoccupation of how you're going to act out. The rituals come in, then you act out, then it's despair at the end of it. At that moment of despair where you're like, I can't believe I've done it again, you can either go to shame and spin around, or you can go to Psalm 51. A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. How does David open the passage? Have mercy on me, O God. Are you going to go vertical to God at that moment? Or are you going to go internal? There is an exit ramp out of shame through Psalm 51. That's beautiful. So, I started off today's episode with um, my story, just a yeah. snippet of it, um, about carrying the weight of shame after having made the decision to have an abortion. And um, I carried that shame for so long. I eventually wound up going to a, um, at that time, it was called a crisis pregnancy center. And, um, and they offered post-abortion Bible studies. Uh, my good friend Pat Layton has one now called Surrender the Secret. It's a great resource. But um, I got into the post-recovery uh, of, of the post-abortion recovery Bible study. I wouldn't even do it in a group. I told the lady, the only way that I will meet with you is by myself. And I had no clue what a huge ask that was of her. And, um, and I told her I wouldn't even walk in the front door of the center because I was too ashamed. So this kind counselor would meet me at the back door each week. She would lead me up a back staircase into a little room mm -hmm. where she would just speak truth about my identity over and over and over. And I could hear her words. And I kept thinking, yes, this applies to most people, mm -hmm. but it doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. And then one day she shared her story and she asked me the question, Lisa, do you know why I do this? Do you know why I volunteer here? And she shared her story of how she had had an abortion. Wow. And there was something so transformative in my ability to believe that the truth she was speaking, if it could apply to her, it could apply to me too. Mm -hmm. And then I knew, I knew what I needed to do if I wanted to get rid of this shame. I needed to get to a place where I was healed enough to share my story. And I just knew, I watched her and, and she told me every time she shares her story, she, she gets healed more and more and more. Of course. And she wasn't speaking out of her brokenness, she was speaking out of the restoration and the redemption of her life. And so it took me a little while, I still had a lot of healing I had to do. And then one day I found out about a young girl that had made an appointment to go have an abortion. And I met her at this little fast food restaurant. I sat across from her, I was terrified to share my story. But when I did, I, it was almost as if the more the light bulbs came on in her eyes sure. and the more she so appreciated my empathy for her situation, the more that I could feel those shackles of shame just and we falling have off of me. Mirror neurons there that you know about, literally that God put in us that it's not just, oh, I can feel this. There are literally these mirror neurons that go on. You literally are healing. And notice this precious lady. She walked you literally. We talked about one of the antidotes to shame is empathy. She literally walked you in and down and up a path of empathy before she even brought to you to God's Word. That's a perfect picture of empathy. And I wouldn't have been ready at that point to yeah. stand up in front of, you know, a whole group of people or even hundreds of people of or certainly not, uh, I wasn't ready yet to share my testimony in front of like the whole church or anything like that. But just doing it one on one, when I saw God take what I felt had not only been used for evil in my life, but had rendered me evil. Mm -hmm. But when I saw yeah. God take that yeah. and use it for good in another person's life, it started to cure me of my shame. And it was a beautiful thing. And so any last thoughts, Joel, or a verse or anything that yeah. you want to 
yeah, in the I, song. And Jim, I want to get your last thoughts too. Yeah, I just think it's so intriguing that sometimes um, we, we maybe overlook that God never asks us to do something that he himself has done first. Yeah. Um, and so I love this, just a couple sentences in Exodus 3, verse 7. The Israelites are in plight. They're um, in bondage in Egypt. And this is what the Lord says to Moses. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt. And so just those descriptive words, he's seen us, he's heard us, he knows of the suffering and therefore he acts. And the intriguing thing about Exodus 3 is the way that God acts is through Moses. That is his sending. Yeah. And I just love the story that you had, Lisa, that the way that God acted in that situation was through that generous, kind um, lady who met you in the moment of your needs so that you can now meet so many people in their moments of need. Absolutely. And I love that it's revealed there so much of what keeps us in shame is that we have something secret that we feel like no one else should ever know, but God already does know. Yeah. He already knows, he already sees us. And I truly believe shame is Satan's signature. Mm, and good. where he can take and write shame across some pages of our life or some part of our life, that's where he feels like, aha, I found the secret that's going to keep you turning to me and hidden in darkness rather than turning to God. Mm -hmm. But the truth is God already sees. He already knows. He is so fully aware. And all he wants us to do is turn from the darkness into the light. And he will be right there to help us. Okay, Jim, wrap us up with anything you have that you want to share. Yeah, the, for me at least, the most shameful event that ever happened ever in recorded history, seen on the largest social network ever, it's recorded in the Word of God, is at Calvary. So shame's been paid in full. Literally Jesus bore, if we will, yes, our sins. Uh, Calvary's, we've talked here, we'll talk again more about the trauma egg. That's Jesus' trauma egg right there. He literally bore all the narratives, the stories, the abuse. Every atrocity that's ever happened to you, he bore that in his body, literally becoming that shame for a moment. So it's been paid for in full, as we know, Tetelestai, paid in full, it is finished. And so that's all been covered. And wherever you are today in your shame, I bring you 1 John 1 7, which I love this verse, memorized as a child. Whatever's gone on, but if we walk in the light, Shame cannot abide in the light. It just cannot. It needs dark crevices. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, it is there. Notice connection. It is there that we fellowship one with another. And then God adds through John, and if you have any doubt, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, told you, cleanses us from what? All sin. All shame. It's been paid in full today. Deuteronomy 30 again, the paths of shame, right? God has set before you as a good, good father the path of, of blessing and of life or the path of, path of cursing or death. And he says, as a good father, choose life. Mm, thank you so much, Jim, Joel. It's always a joy to do this. If you want a list of verses that we've talked about in this show today, Bible verses that I think are going to be the power behind everything that we've shared and certainly the power for you to have in front of you God's Word. At Proverbs 31, we say, if you know the truth and live the truth, it changes everything. So I want to make sure you have these Bible verses. We'll put a link in the show notes so that you can have access to those. Thank you for joining us today. God bless.